The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. My, my message today, the, the title is, hopefully I can get through this, we took a little bit of time at the beginning here, but uh, the, the message, the title for today is Stand Firm and Love Well. In the process of me getting my, my notes and everything for what the Lord was speaking to me during the week is that, actually in the past several weeks, that God in me personally wanted to develop a deeper, a deeper, more intimate trust in him. And I really feel like that's, that's definitely something that we all could use. Um, how many of you know that truth without grace is mean? It is, it can be mean. And that's why we have to be really careful with the sexual issues module because there's a lot of truth, right? But we have to understand and, have, and use wisdom in the application for the people that come to us for help. Because there will be people that come to us for help. And in fact, right now, there, I've heard actually numerous occasions where people are actually coming to people in authority, whether it's a school or a church leader or whoever, and they're asking us for help in this area. It can't be coincidence. And it's very good timing that we're having this module in the beginning of the year, I believe. But anyway, truth without grace is mean, and grace without truth is completely meaningless. When Jesus was here on earth in his human walk so that we would be able to have an example to do ourselves, he was completely committed to the purest and truest teaching of God's word, of course. At the, at the same time, he was completely committed to, to, to be absolutely lavish in his love for people. So he was completely true in, to, to God in, in the word and the truth, but he was completely lavish in his grace towards people and his love. That's where he came. We, we got from the Old Testament to the New Testament. You got the law to grace, basically, is what Jesus came to preach. And my... The thing that the Lord was showing me is that in Jesus' example, um, at the, when the woman that was caught in adultery in John uh, chapter 8, his example there was to be a really good example for us in how to approach culture and different things that are happening right now, people that approach you that are from different walks of life, in order to be able to be helpful and effective we have to learn how to love well, love effectively. We can't just produce, we can't just say the truth is, you know, you got to get out of this or you're going to go to hell. You know, that might work for somebody that's, you know, uh, <laughs> a really strong willed, you need to take it in the nose before they actually get the facts, but it doesn't work for most people. Most people are completely turned off by that, and then, they, then you'll get. How dare you judge me? And you'll be completely like the door was slammed in their face, basically is what they'll feel like. So there's no chance for me to go to heaven. Anyway, when we look at, I want to check out John chapter 8. Now, this, as the story goes, is basically that the, the, the religious leaders took this woman from her bed, from her lover's bed, and brought him before Jesus to, to basically condemn her, to stone her, or what have you, at the time. And, and Jesus' reply in verse, well, let's start at verse 7, I'll read. John chapter 8, verse 7. When they persisted on questioning him, which was Jesus, he stood up and said to them, the one without sin among you should be the first to throw a stone at her. 
And then he stooped down again and continued writing on the ground. When they heard this, they left one by one, starting with the older men. And then only he was left. The, the woman was in the center. When Jesus stood up, he said to her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And she says, no one, Lord. Neither do I condemn you, Jesus said. Go, from now on, do not sin anymore. Don't you just love his response, though? He didn't condemn the woman like the religious legalists. He instead showed her grace. And a lot of people stop there. And they, read, they don't read any further in that, chat, in that, in that verse. Is he's obviously showing grace, and that's what he's teaching here, is that somebody sins... I forgive him and everything's good. But he didn't let her off the hook. He tells her, go, and from now on, do not sin. That was the truth. But he presented it in a way that was palatable, in a way that was effective, with wisdom. And I think that when you avoid either one of those extremes. You don't, you uh, avoid making a line in the sand and saying you're either this or this. You avoid that line altogether and you, and, and you, and you tiptoe on both sides and with effort, something holds you between grace and truth that you need to stand on in order to make that effective for people. What is that? What is that thing that, that, that kept Jesus at that point where he used the wisdom, of the, well, the wisdom of the Father to be able to love, to show grace, but also speak the truth in the same time? What, what was that? And that's what I wanted to know in my prayer time. First, I'm going to... When I say that the, the title was Stand Firm and Love Well, I want to try to define standing firm so you guys don't get confused. And this is why I want to share this morning. The way that I <clears throat> defined it was not compromising our faith. Standing firm is not compromising our faith. And what's that mean? Basically, our convictions, our convictions inside us are all about the choices that we make while we're not being challenged. Faith is our ability through grace to act on those convictions when we are challenged, when we are tested. So basically, what is it? What am I saying? Standing firm is coming through with our faith when we're challenged. It's not just our convictions when we're not being tested, but it is our faith in action when it's in our face. When somebody needs help, when somebody's accusing us, we need to be able to respond in a, in a, in a way that, uh, it, full of wisdom in order to get them back to where Christ wants them. If we stand firm in a culture that consistently tells us to bow down, and I just mentioned this, we must know what we're standing on. And if we're not standing on the word, we're in deep trouble because there's no other foundation than Jesus. And if, we're, if we don't know what we stand on, we're going to be tossed. I like in, in uh, Hebrews 6.19, for we have this hope as an anchor for our lives. Safe and secure, it enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. And what was really neat was this whole week, I struggled, actually several weeks, with some, time, some things in my prayer time that I wanted to deal with. And they all involved safety and security and control and making myself safe, making self-preservation and and, and not trusting God. And when I've, you know, so when I'm, I'm writing this, all my notes out, I'm getting ministered to, and 
all the way up until the last minute, last night at, you know, hours before I needed to finish my notes for the message. I needed deliverance. <laughs> but praise God, because everything that we go through, everything that I go through, I commit to you guys. Because if I can get through it, you can too. And then, and if somebody comes to me and says, how did you do that? I could say, I can let them know. That's, this, that's all it's all about. It's all about you guys. When, when I say love well, I guess most of you guys probably understand the, the meaning of what, I'm, what I, I had behind that. But <clears throat> how many of you know that we can be correct, but we, can, we, we don't necessarily have to be helpful? Sometimes we're correct and we're definitely not helpful. Is it more important that you're right than being righteous? We can, even, we can even mean well. We can we could say the right things and mean well in ourselves, but have it be completely taken the wrong taken the wrong way. If we don't show love the way that God wanted us to in that situation, we're still in the wrong. No matter how what you know I didn't mean to, it doesn't matter. Do you really want to be righteous or do you want to be right? Extending grace and honor even while still offering God's truth, which is the good news of the gospel. We want to extend grace, even honor, to the people that come to us. It's not about whether they deserve, whether I deserve. It doesn't have anything to do with that. It's about showing them Christ. It's, it's about showing them Jesus. You know, and then you look back... And when somebody does approach you and you look back at the woman at the well, you, 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 have to, you have to realize that grace without truth is meaningless. So you can extend grace, but, but you need to have the love enough for that person to ask for godly wisdom to share the truth so that they don't walk off the cliff that they're walking off of. Without saying, hey, you're walking off a cliff, you're going to die. You, you need to have godly wisdom in, or in, in, in representation to be effective. When going back to what I, what I so, so what I, I, the Lord was showing me was there's, there's the, tr the truth and grace uh, tug of war type of thing. It's so easy to go one way or the other. It's so easy to become judgmental, <clears throat> sit back and, and be all pious and live your own Christian life and talk down to people, even if it's just in your head. It's in your heart, you know, it's an attitude. You could go that way. It's very simple. It doesn't take much effort. It's very humanistic. You could go the completely other way. Everything goes is fine. And be all grace, grace, everything's grace. Everything's covered. And everything's okay. And every, everybody's saved and going to heaven. Um, what I saw was the Lord showed me that, like a, you know, um, what's a, t a tether ball where they have that pole and they have the string on the ball and, you know, but it, it, it can be it swing either, either direction, right? And that's kind of like the grace and truth thing. But what keeps you tethered? And so I'm still, I'm still asking the Lord, what keeps you, what, what, what keeps that so that you don't swing one way or the other? What's the strength there? I, I am sorry. <laughs> I'm not sorry because this is, I'm like getting toasted up here. I just, I want you guys to get it because I can't be the only one. <clears throat> I didn't even really say that much profound stuff, but what the Lord just showed me <clears throat> was I, I looked at Isaiah 6 and I was like, so. You know, and I'm continually asking, what does, what's this anchor? What do I hold on to in order to be able to be loving and truthful 
in the same, because I know that it's a struggle and that it, it takes effort not to go either way or to go both ways, depending on what the Lord wants. But, so he showed me Isaiah 6, 1, and I, and I, was start, I started to read the, ch- the chapter. And I mean, he, he cut me short after the first line. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. And I was like, oh, man, history. <laughs> I'm not... <laughs> oh. <clears throat> I like profound emotional statements that, you know, I don't... Unless somebody can make history really, you know, alive, it's just... Blah. To me, it always was. Hardest class. Anyway, so that's what I was reading this first thing. But when I... When I <laughs> Putting myself aside, I, I said, okay, well, first of all, who is Uzziah? And what was his significance? What was the significance of the timing of his death? And because Isaiah 6 is the commissioning of Isaiah, what was the significance of the timing of his death? Because it says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. And that was the beginning of that, everything for Isaiah. So what I did was I looked up Uzziah, and I found him in 2 Chronicles, believe it or not. I didn't have to go through any type of, you know, Google search. In 2 Chronicles chapter 26, <clears throat> Boy, numbers, numbers and Chronicles I, I don't really ever, I never really got into. But... <clears throat> Starting in verse 3, in chapter 26 of Second Chronicles, I saw Uzziah was a 16-year-old when he became king, and he reigned 52 years in Jerusalem. Now, Uzziah was actually a direct descendant of David, like 10 or 11 generations back. I didn't know that, but I, I, I found that out later, but I thought that was really neat. Anyway. And we go on. His mother's name was Jecoliah of Jerusalem. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing these correctly, but it's okay. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Amaziah had done. He sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the visions of God. And as long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. Did he sound like a good man? He sounded like a good king. He reigned for 52 years, and he sought the Lord. Now, he went out and made war against the Philistines, it says in verse 6, and broke down the wall of Gath, the wall of Jabeth, Jabne, the wall of Ashdod, and he built cities around Ashdod among the Philistines. Uh, Verse 7, God helped him against the Philistines, against the Arabians, who lived in Gerbaal, against the Munites, also... The Ammonites brought tribute to Uzziah as his fame spread as far as the entrance of Egypt, and he became exceedingly strong. This is fantastic. I mean, when you look at, when you look at the stories of David and how, how awesome, everything that he went through and, and, and his, the strength that was continually built in him because he sought the Lord before every battle. He sought the Lord for every single situation in his life. It's just an awesome picture of how we are supposed to be doing, we're supposed to be doing this. We're not supposed to be taking control and saying we know better. We don't know better. Even, even David, who was after God's, I mean, he was this awesome man of God, man of power, this huge armies that followed him and had him, and he still inquired of God all the time. Didn't make him weak at all. Didn't, didn't make him look like he, you know, didn't know what he was doing. Oh, he's going to go pray if he obviously doesn't know anything what to do. Not that at all. So this man, it seems like he was a good man, a good, great king. Um, he became exceedingly strong. And Uzziah built towers in Jerusalem and, 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 in, the, and in the plains. He, un, he uncorked some of, the, some of the old wells. And eventually in the lands, became very prosperous. He was able to build all kinds of things where they weren't even able to build before because of the, 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 the water and, and the lands were tilled. And he became very wealthy. 
<clears throat> he had huge armies. His, his fame spread far and wide as far... He was, he was just marvelous. It says it in uh, verse 15, I believe. So his fame spread far and wide, for he was marv- marvelously helped <laughs> till he became strong. And I was like, oh, till he became strong. Then what happened? Mind you, I still have this question. What is the thing that keeps you firm between grace and truth with people? What keeps you solid? What keeps you anchored? And I'm reading this going, hmm, this poor guy. Not really. But when he was strong and his, his heart was lifted up, and it was to his destruction, for he transgressed against the Lord his God by entering the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. Okay. So what we're, we're, we're looking at here is a situation where he has become, this, this man has become awesome. God has led him. Every time that he searched out God, God provided for him. It's, it's what he does for us as well. That's, that's just the, uh, that's a biblical statement. We seek him, we find him, you know. Now, what was wrong with him going into the temple to worship? His, he, he became lifted up inside himself. It was a hard attitude. Outwardly, he was going to the temple to worship. Outwardly, he's a really great guy still. He kept the ball rolling. Is based, you know, from what everybody else saw, it was okay until the priest got a hold of him. And they said, You don't belong here. You have no, no longer have honor from our Lord God. And he got mad. And he was holding, he was still holding the censer in his hand with, uh, to, for the incense. But he got so mad. Leprosy broke out on his forehead. And back then, leprosy was a sign of sin. You got sin in your life. You got, you got issues. So he was completely out. He was completely outed as a leper from that point on. And in fact, he wasn't even buried with, with the other kings. He was buried in a field with lepers. And so at that point, then, his son took over. But that's basically where... Isaiah 6 starts. So if we go back to Isaiah 6, in the year that King Uzziah died as a leper, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up. Isaiah always always chokes me up because it's so it's such a powerful anointed book in the scriptures. It's like God is speaking to me right inside me. But what did I, so what did Uzziah represent? He was lifted up in his heart. Uzziah, I mean, this is point blank. He he represented pride. And um, so like what Lord, <laughs> what are you still? What are you telling me here? I understand, I am, I'm understanding the story. But in order for the beginning of, the commissioning of, of Isaiah to actually begin, that pride, that spirit of pride had to be removed. Not just from Isaiah, but it had to be removed. It was a spirit of pride over that whole situation. It had to be removed out of office. <laughs> And then what happened? He died. I saw the Lord. It's a, it's a, it's when you, pride, it's so blinding and it doesn't see itself. But when pride was removed, he saw the Lord. It's so profound and it's one sentence. (laughs) When the year the King Uzziah died, 
pride left the building, and I saw the Lord. I finally saw who I really obey. What I've done these things in the first five chapters <laughs> that were in my book of Isaiah, those first five things that I did in those, those chapters, woe is, woe is you who, you know, call sin not sin, and woe is you drunkards, and woe is you take heavy drink. What happens? He sees the Lord, and he sees the glory, that, the, the, the robe that filled the temple, the glory that filled the temple. And above it stood seraphim. And it reminds me also of, of in, in Revelations, what John spoke of the seraphim, that were crying, holy, holy, holy. Now, when you look at holy, 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 and you think, I think, verily, verily, you know, anytime that there's a double, there's, a, there's like an emphasis meaning in it. And then for it to say, holy, 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 and the only other place is in, I believe it's in Revelations. Where it's the same thing, holy, holy. I was like, this is this is the, the the utmost amount of holy that you could you could actually you know give in a writing, so that the reader would actually see that, get the, get the feeling of it. These, the, I like the the way that it says it because it's like, and, and it, holy, 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 and the, the whole earth is full of His glory. It's it's there the seraphim are constantly getting, I like to think of it this way, they're constantly getting glimpses of a different facet of his glory. And they can't take it. So they go, glory! They go, holy! Holy! Every time it happens. And that was their only, that was like their job. For all eternity, from beginning to end. And it never stops because it never, it, it, he, he continuously is unfolding. I can't, I can't even imagine it, but this is what he saw. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice whom who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people with unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Who is that? Jesus. He saw Jesus. What's really awesome about this, I mean, all of it is awesome. God is awesome. When you look at, woe is me, for I am undone, and after five chapters of him saying, woe is you, woe to you, woe to you, and he finally was like, I finally see the God whom I'm serving that's telling me to say woe to those people. And I'm finally hitting my face before him, humbled immediately. Woe is me. And he was, he was like, he was cleaned up. He was, he was like, compared to most of the people that he spoke to, he was on top of the things that he was the only one that, that, that God spoke to at that time. You know, and he was, woe is me. Huh. For I am undone. And I just remember, I just remember the, the song that we were singing. That one, the one phrase in that song, it says, I want to see, I want to be undone. Do you realize what he's feeling here, what he experienced is... The Lord showed me a baseball. And this because there's seams on the baseball. And no matter how many times I've ever seen a pro hit a baseball, maybe three times in my life have I ever seen the skin rip. And it was because it was an off offset, spun the ball sideways, whatever. But in order to hit the ball, in order to get the seams to burst. You have to hit the ball at 400 miles an hour with that force. Where the, the, the fastest pitch I ever made was like 100.9 or something like that in, in baseball. It would take four times that in order to actually bust the seams off the ball. Now, when you, when you take the ball and you're, and, you're, and you're crushing it with 400, <laughs> 400 mile an hour pressure, I'm not sure exactly what that's called. 
and you and you and and you want it, and you crush it until it, the seams actually pop on it. I'd imagine that's what he felt like. <laughs> that's why I saw this baseball in the first place. I was like, "You want to be undone, huh?" And we sing it kind of flippantly, but it's our it's my heart cry. I want to be undone. Not just for me and for kicks. That sounds awful. <laughs> but for, for, for you guys, for, for the people that we meet, for the people that, that need us to get the stuff out, you know? Woe is me, for I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. And what's really interesting about this, when did God start speaking to him? When did he hear it? Not until he was cleansed. Not until that coal touched his lips did God even speak to him. What does that say? I don't know. I look back at some of the, some of the verses as, you know, blessed are the pure at heart for they shall see God. It's like, this is whole purification process of, of Isaiah. So he could see and hear God. It's really neat. It was funny because when I saw the baseball bat, I remember this movie back in early 90s. I think it was called The Sandlot. And it was, it was fictional. I think it was Disney. And it was about um, Benny the Jet. And he knocked the, he knocked the, the ball out of the, the backyard uh, sandlot that they had playing back, uh, baseball and smashed the ball into smithereens while it flew out. And he, he was like legendary for the kids. And so that's where, like a legend was born that way. But yeah, it can't. That, that, the busting of the seams. I felt it this week. <laughs> I did. So, so Uzziah's issue was pride. And so when I was like, well, if it has to be removed in order for the rest of this to come across with, you know, in Isaiah, what are you speaking to me? Because my original question was, how do I maintain a, in, the, in this culture, how do I maintain my beliefs and my convictions without being, you know, called a, a you know, or whatever, or overlooking everything so that people just die in their sin. And so he told me, well, his, his issue was pride, but what's the opposite? The opposite of pride is humility. Now, you know, there's two different types of pride. There's, there's pride of inferiority and there's pride of superiority. There's, there's you know, thinking so highly of yourself and there's think, thinking so lowly of yourself. And a lot of people get humility and the, the lowly part of pride kind of confused. But both are pride. And neither one of them are effective, especially if you're trying to reach people. Um, thinking less of yourself Thinking less, of your, <clears throat> thinking less of yourself is not humility. That's, that's pride of inferiority. Thinking of yourself less is humility. You're not in the picture. You're not involved. They are. It's all about you guys. What's really interesting about this, too, is the Lord was speaking to me um, about the, the spirit of pride and the spirit of religion and how they're so uh, closely used together. And, and this is a lot of times why we don't even see it ourselves. We don't see it a lot of times in other people either, as far as how we discern things. Because pride keeps us from saying that we actually have a spirit of religion. It, it keeps us from even searching it out when we do have a spirit of religion. And the spirit of religion hides pride with religious activity. So it's kind of, it's hard to spot. And, you know, it's, it's a whole lot easier when, you're, when you say, Lord, you search me for any secret thoughts, any, any hidden sin, any hurtful ways that I have, you know, 
it's so much easier than trying to knit, trying to find certain things. Just allow the Holy Spirit to search, and it ends up being ten times easier. But that's one of the examples why. It's kind of it's kind of like the same thing with control and idolatry. I I I, I mean, even up until last night, I had to get some deliverance on control issues. I don't, I'll admit it. <laughs> you know, I, the things, the preferences, the things that you like, the things that you wish you could have in order to feel safe. And what, did, what you know, what is this hope? And, it, and, it, and it's safe. And it, God is supposed to be all of those things for us. But my, my situation was, I like to have everything neat and organized in its own place. You can't have kids if you, you know. You can't just you just can't have kids if you do that. You put them in their place, you know, but when they're old enough to understand discipline. But but it's like I needed I, I felt like I needed it because what happened was is I believed it. Just like culture tries to change our name and make us believe that and pull us away, we can do that to ourselves sometimes through the different issues that we don't deal with and that we take on as our identity. Like mm, I want to say, is like, there's certain people, like, if you have MS or if you have certain things and you identify with that problem, if you have a disorder of any kind and you're identifying with that disorder and not who God says you are, then you know what I'm saying. But it could take so long that, that it, it become, you feel like it becomes a part and you allow that lie because it's not truth, to become a part of you. And then you, have to, and then you have to receive forgiveness. You have to repent. You have to get rid of this junk. Get the truth of what God's speaking and what, who God says that you are in your true identity and, and run with that. But it, it takes some effort and it, ta- and it takes some realization on your part and it takes some Holy Spirit to, you know, and allowing the Holy Spirit to show you those things because a lot of times they're not very evident. So going back to humility. Humility now, I believe, is what ties us between the two. You cannot, you cannot offer truth. Don't offer truth if you're not, if you're not completely humble. It won't be received. And don't offer grace unless you're completely humble. Because you'll be mocked, you'll be walked all over. And you won't be a hill of beans good for either either one. If you approach a situation when people are coming to you for help with humility, before your face, before God, pleading for these people, whoever it is, for an answer, for wisdom, is the only way you should be offering truth. He didn't crush. He didn't beat the woman at the well. He, he, he didn't smash her, smack her around with the truth of the, what's going on here. He offered her grace. And then, because he showed her love and honor, he told her what really needs to happen. Humility is the anchoring unit we need to have between grace and truth. It takes surrendering your will to his will, letting go of your control or your grip. Godly humility is an attitude. It is knowing that we have an utter dependence on God. It's an inner knowing that nothing we do, nothing we can accomplish, nothing that we can say can help anybody it's all about him. It's, we, we depend utterly on him. It's a, it's a constant awareness that I can't breathe without him. I was talking about David earlier. He was a great example of, of, of why this was so important. And he, as he inquired of the Lord before every, every situation... 
all his his battles, he required he he asked for wisdom and guidance. Humility creates an increase in our capacity for intimacy with God. I'm going to say that again. Humility creates an increase in our capacity for intimacy with God. I'm getting to a really exciting part because the Lord spoke to me directly. It was like knocking on my car window type of thing. Intimacy with God. With God, we can find the balance between bowing down and being a doormat or becoming hardened into a self-righteous ramrod. But avoiding these extremes requires humility. It requires compassion. It requires utter dependence on God. By relying on His Holy Spirit to guide us in godly wisdom, we can be steadfast, but we can express both His holy righteousness and His gracious love at the same time. Without compromising ourselves, we want to become a catalyst, not just for renewal or revival, not just renewal or revival for these people. We want to be able to affect, we want to be able to affect our country. We want to be able to affect the nation, the people that, that, that really need this, not just the church people here. We want to be part of a reformation because that's what needs to happen. There, there is no fighting well, let's just put it this way. Nobody has ever been saved by winning an argument. No, you can never get nobody saved that way. But if you show love and compassion, extend grace, but give, you know, ask yourself for, to the Lord for wisdom on how to, how to actually share the truth, to be effective in your love. That's where we're missing out. We could be right. We could be, you know, what good is it to be right? I mean, really, in your own eyes, what good is it to be right? We can be a people of excellent influence when we know in our heart of hearts that our goal is not to be right, but our goal is to be effective. And to be effective, I'm going to go through this one real slow, because this is what he was showing me. Our goal is not to be right. We have to remember this, is to be effective with people. And to be effective, we must trust God and learn to trust His will. And to trust Him, you must know Him intimately. There's no other way. If you know God intimately, you will trust Him. And to know Him intimately you have to begin with humility, a humble and contrite spirit. I shared with you the scripture that he gave me right before I woke up this morning. First Corinthians, I've been reading First Corinthians for several weeks, but this one actually was going on in my head as I was waking up this morning. Death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? Now the sting of death is sin, but the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's all that was replaying over and over in my head. And that's all I want for you guys because he gives us the victory. The victory is through Jesus Christ. We, can, we have the ability to set people free. We have the, pe- the ability to give people hope. Therefore, my dear brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the Lord's work, knowing that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. How many people consider, you know, their work is, is, is so tedious and you just don't feel like you're getting anything out of it and everything, but when you are completely devoted into giving your work to the Lord, it's a whole different point of view. What you do is, 
it's like it's never working unto your own self. It's working because I know that this is going to help other people. If I can get through this, anybody can, right? And yeah, and this is where this is where the Lord was speaking to me early in the week. Matthew 18. Because I was like, how do I develop this humility? How do I, de- how do I develop this, this deeper trust that he's calling for? And how do I get the congregation to see this as well? And he says, Matthew 18, 2 to 4, verses 2 to 4, starting with verse 2. And he called a child to himself, and he set him before them, and said, Truly I say to you, unless you are converted to become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself as this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And I immediately saw in my mind's eye a picture of my little boy. (laughs) And his eyes just huge. And he always looks, you know, when, when I walk into the room or see him for the first time in the morning or or if you hand him something brand new that he has never seen before, his eyes get real big and you could just see, oh my gosh, what is this? How, what, is, what do I do with this? And wow, this is awesome. It's beautiful. It's beautiful to see. And he's calling us to humble ourselves as his child. He wants to restore that joy, that awe, that, that amazement that wonder. And you can only get it through humbling yourself as a child and stare wide-eyed in amazement at such an awesome, wonderful God that we have. His goodness is so just ginormous. (laughs) And the only, I mean, I, I say awesome a lot, but you know what? There's only one that is awesome. There's only one that's good. And we can stand in awe in our worship services. We can stand wide-eyed and wait to see what the Lord's going to do. We need to, 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 to allow the Lord to develop that back into our spirits. Because all things are possible. Amen? Amen? All things are possible. It's like, it's like looking at everything, looking at God. It's just like when you, when you see a kid at, at Christmas time and he's, and he's you know, sitting in front of all these toys and he's just like, Oh, man, and he wants to tear into everything. And what's this one going to have? We need to get back to that place with God. When we, when we first got our salvation experience and that joy was there, and that, that, that was like God could do anything, and I could do anything, and the grass is greener and the sky is bluer, we can get back there, but it takes humility. It really, you got to humble yourself. And, and approach him the way that you were, with humble, like anything can happen. You can do all things. You can. And that's, that's what's incredible is God wants to instill that back into us. We don't have to be, you know, we don't have to be like immature brats type of thing, but he's calling us as, as, as a child believes. Like Landon can stand at the top, I mean, Haven can stand at the top of the stairs and, and jump without even thinking that I'm not going to catch her. And I might miss. There's been times that she's come down sliding board that I missed. But it's like, <laughs> but it's like, that's how he wants to bring us back to. He is an amazing, loving father. Amazing, good father. He wants us to be ready for anything. He wants us to be excited that anything is possible. He wants us to be able to relate that to people when they come to us for help. He wants us to relate that people. He wants Jesus to come out. He wants us to be undone. Lord, just remove any obstacles, Father, right now. We just ask you for an increase in capacity for our intimacy, intimate relationship with you, Father. We just, we ask, Lord, that you would even share the wisdom with us to be able to humble ourselves. Father, I know that there's times in our lives that that we become humbled, but Lord, let us do this ourselves in honor of you. 
We want a deeper, more intimate relationship with you so that we would be able to help those in need. We want to have victory over the enemy. Help us, Lord, to be a people who can stand firm and love well, as you have called us to do. In Jesus' name. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com. Did you know that we have an online school available? Hi, I'm Pastor Jason Clark. We invite you to join our international community of almost a thousand students currently enrolled in a school like no other. Team Embassy equips believers to live in the spirit by giving them the how-to tools for wholeness intimacy with God, and living the abundant life Jesus promised us. You will learn how to heal emotional pain quickly and completely. You'll discover amazing keys to tap into the fruit of the Spirit and practice the presence of God as a lifestyle. Exciting courses available include the 60-Day Challenge, Self-Deliverance, Healing Rejection, Codependency, Intimate Prayer, The Functions of the Human Spirit, and many, many more. It's formatted so that you could take it with you on all your mobile devices. Sign up today at training.teamembassy.com. Be transformed. Become all God created you to be. You will never be the same.